Well, Claudia, Joel, 2024 marks 10 years, a full decade, since the beginning of the movement for black lives, uh, something that I consider to be the most consequential uh, political movement in the United States in the post-civil rights era. Of course, this is sparked off when uh, 18-year-old Mike Brown was killed by uh, Officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson, Missouri. Not a place that a lot of people in the U.S. have heard of, but you know, not a lot of people had heard of Selma, Alabama either until uh, the movement brought itself there. And in the time since, we've seen uh, this iteration of the black liberation struggle as movements do uh, go through different stages, different shifts. Uh, we've seen, I think, different ideological influences, perhaps some more uh, uh, positive than, than others. And especially, you know, a little later on, we'll get into sort of the, the 2020 era with George Floyd and all of that. But uh, I really wanted to get into, you know, the, the, the lessons that uh, we can glean from this 10 year period. Because I think there's a lot that is in there in terms of how the black liberation struggle moves forward for this point. And Claudia, I know you had the opportunity to be in Ferguson when the uh, uh, uprising began before it spread uh, to the rest of the country. And so I'm just curious, as someone who's able to see a lot of these dynamics up front, I mean, what do you think are some things that we should take away uh, uh, from that era in terms of how we think about organizing a struggle? Well, Sean, I think, you know, there is a long lineage of rebellions um, For sure. <laughs> across this country for many decades. And the Ferguson Rebellion is part of that lineage, the Watts Rebellion, the rebellions that happened in Newark and Detroit. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there was a breakage in lineage that didn't prepare young people in Ferguson to um, fight back, fully equipped against the state at that particular moment. I was in, I remember I was in the South Bronx where I'm from and watching the TV and in a very sensationalist way, the corporate media said, this is happening in Ferguson and looting and rioting and you know, and this all comes after the death, not the killing, the death of teenager Mark, Mike, Mike Brown. Um, and I was there and I saw all of this and I was like, man, the revolution is coming. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like a lot of young people felt that sentiment and we understood that it was um, black, poor, brown, poor folks that were revolting against a state that also killed Eric Garner right. in New York City, right. which were not too far away from each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I had, I had a level of consciousness that came from working with elders in movements like to free Mumia Abu Jamal, right? Mm -hmm. um, movements against the fight. Um, movements against police brutality around the case of Am Amadou Diallo mm -hmm. or, you know, the case of Anthony Baez and other folks in New York City. So to me, it, all of these things kind of were part of the same struggle. The struggle against a capitalist state that has an army <laughs> in the police departments across this country. Um, I was seven months pregnant. We took a, bu a bus from, uh, from New York City, from the South Bronx, to, to Ferguson, Missouri. Oh, wow. Um, it was, actually, it was a, a 15 passenger van. And it was a whole bunch of young people from uh, the Rebel Diaz Arts Collective that decided to go. And when we, when we landed in Ferguson, the scenario wasn't that different from the scenario of a community in, in any of the poor communities in New York City or poor communities anywhere else across the country. Um, Ferguson could have been anywhere. For sure. That was a feeling. And the folks that actually received us in Ferguson were folks that were part of street organizations, so mm -hmm. gangs, mm -hmm. um, homeless young people. You know, uh, Lost Voices was an organization that came from that Ferguson rebellion that, that kind of brought together these homeless young people who would actually put tents in front of the precinct and were there all throughout, you know? Um, so we were met by them when we got out of the van and it was very endearing to me that in the context of all this, 
there were families that were coming out at all times. Like they, it wasn't like this was just young black men out in the street as the media had portrayed it, creating chaos. This was working class people, entire families on the streets, um, showing their, their disgust and willing to fight to be able to transform what we understood wasn't so, solely Ferguson, but the actual system. Um, and it's crazy to me that that energy was 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 do, redirected. You know, mm-hmm. when you, you asked about the the lessons. I think that there's a lot of lessons in Ferguson. There's the lessons of the potential that people have to come together um, organically and resist for the amount of time that people resisted in Ferguson um, with the state coming on against them, with the media coming against them, mm-hmm. um, with, you know, all sorts of counterinsurgency, because that's, that's what it is. You know, um, I think it's important to know, you know, the role of social media in Ferguson was huge for the resistance, but it was also huge for the state. Mm. Data mining happened, you know, going into identifying these leaders and going into their Facebook pages and identifying the Twitter account and, and collecting where these people lived, collecting where these people worked and launching attacks on these people, uh, on these leaders in Ferguson. Um, so the role of social media was important and it was highly significant for the state as well. I think, you know, the demands that were lifted during that during that time were speak to the level of breakage and lineage that I'm that was speaking about. People didn't quite understand just how equipped and how sophisticated the capitalist state is. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, you know, the the demand alone of jailing killer cops was not enough. It wasn't going to, it, it's not a matter of bad apples. It's yeah. a systemic thing. And so I think that there, there was a chant. Um, it was com- convict, indict. Send the killer cop, cop to jail. jail. The whole, whole damn system. system is, right? So it's like the same system that you're saying is, is a mess. Mm-hmm. doesn't work for the people. It's the same system that you expect to do all these things to killer caps, you know? And, and, and that speaks to the to where we were and to where young people were, you know, hands up, don't shoot, and you still get shot at Mm -hmm. (laughs) with rubber bullets. You still get tear gassed, you know. Um, You still get martial law. Like, all of these things, that speaks to the lack of of, um, preparedness of of a generation. I think that there was a, that type of attack radicalized a lot of young people. Mm-hmm. It politicized a lot of young people. It helped them understand, you know, that, that the police is not our friends. The police is part of a of a system that prioritizes private property over people. Mm-hmm. That the police is there to surveil. That the police is there to attack our humanity. I mean, we, we need to take into consideration the context in which Ferguson happens. Like, Ferguson, it doesn't just happen. Ferguson is not this thing that is like very unique. Ferguson mm-hmm. is communities that are being displaced from ma- from major cities um, into the suburb, suburbs that are not equipped for black and brown poor people to come into. That the whole entire infrastructure and the way in which they are organized are not for poor communities to come into. I mean, Mike Brown was walking on the street mm-hmm. because there's no sidewalk, because it's not expected for people to walk in the side and the sidewalk in suburbs, you should be driving. There's there's a, another level of status. And so, you know, when you think about the way in which the police department and other institutions that are government institutions were organized, um, mostly white. And so there's a racial profiling, there's the harassment that happens daily. And so when people see a Mike Brown that is shot and killed and left to bleed out in the heat, they see themselves because they too need to walk on the streets. They can't walk on the sidewalks because they too have been harassed by police when they're driving from one place to the next because they too are getting, you know, traffic tickets that amount to warrants because they can't pay them tickets. 
they see themselves and so it's a va it's not it's not happening in a vacuum it's happening within a context and it will continue to happen for as long as we have a system that allows um police to behave the way that they do precisely to preserve the very system you know that that we know as capitalism and so there's so many lessons there's a, there's a lesson of again counterinsurgency a lot of these young people again were identified as leaders this, the media came and created celebrities out of these young people surely did they identified young people who were better versed than others <laughs> that had you know privileged in terms of education that had a better presence that and they they made that distinction between those that were you know foot on the ground doing the work protesting and kind of highlighted these people that creates a, a level of distrust among among people in the movement because why is that person when it's a collective effort mm -hmm. um there is you know the the question of the nonprofits. you know a lot of the that energy was again organic energy there was not political organizations that could then direct that in a way that made sense, um, in a way that built people power, rather than, you know, nonprofits that came in or funders that came in to be able to, again, identify several of those leaders and build organizations um, that they wanted like it was i think it was a genuine desire from these young people to build revolution but the instrument of nonprofits doesn't allow you to build revolution it's actually not there to build revolution and again thinking about our lineage and thinking about history you know the ford foundation is an imperialist tool <laughs> it's a capitalist tool and so like how do you expect their instruments to be the ones to free us but but a lot of us and a lot of the young people in that space again we're we're were not able to access that memory because there wasn't a political organization that had that memory right. to be able to say, look, this is what has happened from Watts to now. And these are these institutions and these processes are not ours. We need to build our own. And so, you know, the need to build political organizations that are equipped to meet the energy of the people when they are out in the street and also after, you know, those moments of mobilizations are, are done. Right. We need to be able to direct that that energy and, and Ferguson, unfortunately, you know, left a lot of people who were politicized, radicalized with instruments that that were limited mm. with vehicles that that have proven to not necessarily um, build like the strength of our black communities in the way that is necessitated in in any of our struggles. And so I think it's a lot to, to be learned about how the state intervene and how, you know, again, how how unequipped a lot of our young people were in that particular moment. Um, but one good thing that did happen, I think, is that with that radicalization came the deepening of consciousness that I think prepared us for a next stage of movement yeah. building. You raise a number of important points, Claudia, and particularly when you talk about the lineage or what, you know, the historian Vincent Harding talks about how there's a river, right, uh, of, of a black freedom struggle in the United States. And when you talk about that break in the lineage, the the source of that break was when the capitalist state, the whole of it, mm -hmm. mobilized to, to crush the black liberation struggle right. in the 60s and 70s. And so we had this, this, this gap, this like deep valley that the struggle went into for a while that didn't quite uh, uh, come back until uh, Ferguson, at least in that that same mass kind of way. And, and Joel, I want to bring you in here because uh, Claudia was talking about um, uh, the, the the issue of co-optation mm -hmm. and how the media uh, sort of uh, uh, crowned, uh, you know, exalted certain people as movement leaders, even if they wasn't really in the movement like that. You feel what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Mm -hmm. And what gets me, and we'll get to, to 2020, but is, is that some of these same folks whose faces were plastered over everything, anything to do with Black Lives Matter, you saw them, they got podcasts and deals and all kinds of things, but 2020 rolls around and they wasn't outside. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm curious your thoughts about this issue of uh, a co-optation in the movement, how we've seen that play out over this uh, last decade or so. I know that's a lot of time, but it's 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 an important aspect because it seems to uh, Claudia's point that there was a very intentional effort to try to seize that grassroots energy 
that started in Ferguson into directed in something that wouldn't threaten the capitalist state? Yeah, I think, you know, we live under capitalism, right? Everything has to be commodified. Everything has to be coca cola sold back to us, you know? Um, Coca-Cola-fied. <laughs> yeah, coca cola um, And, you know, we, we, we definitely saw that in 2014 uh, and subsequent years, too. Um, every time there's an uprising of any sorts that looks like it has the potential to, to be a detonator, you know what I mean, in the country for, for a larger mass swell of people to be out in the streets, you know, our opposition, you know, the capitalist state, you know, the people that it protects, they sit down together and they have focus groups and, you know, they say, hey, how can we do this? They immediately set out to start finding ways to pick apart elements of the movement that's happening, um, you know, isolate the bad people from the good people or whatever, the bad protester from the good protester, try and find, um, you know, people who, who, whose politics might be in a way watered down um, from the demands of the actual mass movement. They find those people, they endorse those people, they give those people money, they give those people spots on MSNBC and CNN and uh, you know other bourgeois media outlets. They sell them back to us as leaders of a movement that they had really little to no part in building from the ground up, right? And so this process starts immediately on the ground. Um, I like to call it, you know, Claudia mentioned counterinsurgency and how counterinsurgency is not just, you know, SWAT kicking down your door. Um, there's also like, I call it carrot counterinsurgency and I <laughs> carrot counterinsurgency in contrast to stick counterinsurgency. Carrot counterinsurgency is what, I'm, is what we're talking about with co-optation, mm -hmm. right? It's, um, it's trying to isolate and pick apart the movement quietly, peacefully, trying to get it to turn in on itself um, you know, offer it carrots so that, you know, it can, it can get people to go home because that's what they want. They want people to go home, right? Um, and this is actually one of the preferred methods that the capitalist state uses. I, it's, it's their preferred method. You know, the stick method, you know, the, 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 the brutal force that they use, um, you know, in the streets, it's, I would argue that it isn't their preferred method because it comes with the risk of, you know, radicalizing more people, of getting people out in the streets more. You know, I think about like, uh, you know, in 2011, during like Occupy Wall Street, when that was going on, one of the things that got more people out into the streets was this, was this viral video of these police officers who just pepper sprayed a handcuff woman, right? And next thing you know, now it's not just swelling in New York City, now there's stuff going on in Washington, D.C., where I was at the time, in the Bay, um, you know, in Chicago, Detroit, all over the place, right? And so, you know, counterinsurgency is about uh, the kind of correct application of the carrot in the stick, depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in 2014, we saw, well, we saw both at work for sure. Um, but I think the carrot counterinsurgency was the thing um, that I think that that was utilized uh, in a way that, that took the sales out of, out of that particular phase of, of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and it was, you know, it was masterful. And, and Claudia said, like, they, we didn't necessarily have the language to articulate what was going on at the time. Mm -hmm. um, even though, like, these are strategies that, you know, the capitalist state has used, not even just against us in the United States, but all over the world in order to put down popular uprisings um, in anything that they can view as an insurgency, which, according to the capitalist state, anything that opposes them is considered an insurgency. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's a method that, that they try, um, but, you know, sometimes it fails. And when it does fail, that's when they wield out the stick, right? I think that we're seeing that in a lot of ways right now, like uh, you know, with the Palestine movement, For you sure. know, that is a movement that, you know, in my opinion, at this point has thus far been unable to be co-opted by these same elements, right? There have been attempts, but I think people are very, very hip to that now. Yeah. They're very able to see when there are elements that are trying to opportunistically take advantage of the situation to either water down the demands of the Palestine movement, the movement to free Palestine, to lift the siege on Gaza. Um, and, and people are, are very much you know, keenly aware of that. But I would also argue that that awareness probably would not uh, be so apparent now were it not for mm -hmm. these previous uprisings that have taken place in the country before. Claudia also said, you know, like, these movements build upon each other, right? Every, everything, you know, like these chronological events that happen, they build on the things that happened before it. Even though there is a gap, like 
you know, people are now looking into this history and are now looking at, oh yeah, this is what, you know, CoinTelPro did in the 1960s. What, what are the, what are the sort of patterns that they did back then that we can see now that are being employed against us? Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, 2014 was, you know, the Ferguson uprising was an explosion, right? But it also was years in the making as well. You know what I mean? Like I, first came into political consciousness in 2011. My first protest was you know, against the execution of Troy Davis in 2011 in Georgia. Um, you know, There was a temporary stay and then that stay was revoked. I got home from the protest and I discovered that they had went through with the execution despite them having no evidence, uh, like real hard evidence against him. You know, The following year, we saw the murder of Trayvon Martin by that pig George Zimmerman um, and you know, the exoneration of him after that. Uh, in 2013, uh, you know, I was in Brooklyn at the time. Within three months of living up here, um, the cops killed a 16-year-old kid, Kimani Gray, mm -hmm. in Flatbush. Um, there was an uprising, a very localized uprising, um, but it was an uprising nonetheless. Police deployed, police, yeah, the, <laughs> that counterinsurgency was in full force in both the carrot and the stick. You know, we saw the police using helicopters, you know, to, you know, and, and tear gas and, and rubber bullets and, and just overwhelming brutality against kids, against yeah. black kids. Um, and at the same time, um, they were very, very quick to employ black misleaders, you know, people, you know, self-appointed community leaders and clergy and, and people that were, had, had very much um, aligned uh, interest in maintaining the status quo um, and maintaining their class position. All of that was wheeled out. And, uh, and then, of course, in 2014, you have uh, Mike Brown, who was killed in Ferguson, and then Eric Garner, who was killed in New York City a month before. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, we're, we're seeing all these things. And these uprisings and these people coming out to the streets are getting an education into what all of this really, really means. They're seeing, you know, the black misleaders. They're also seeing the state, you know, the, the police wield this just overwhelming brutality against people who have nothing but their hands, right? Um, and all of these experiences are preparing the people for the next one and the next one and the next one until those tables turn. Um, and so I think, you know, when it comes to, you know, co-optation, we have to still be on guard for that in all of its manifestations. You know, we're, we have to be just aware of how, you know, like how these things work. We can't be fooled by Nancy Pelosi donning Kente cough and doing the black power fist. We, we know what this, no we, <laughs> we know what this looks like, yeah. right? And we're not stupid. The people are not stupid, right? Um, but, you know, I think we even still, like with this sort of growing awareness, we still have a lot of work to do and a lot of, a lot of conclusions to come by, but that can only happen through the experience of struggle itself. I, I wanted to intervene just to say, like, in, the, in this question of counterinsurgency, how entrapment is used, mm -hmm. and infil infiltration as well. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. infiltration was deep in Ferguson, and agent provocateurs were utilized to burn, you know, uh, gas stop stations. Um, there, <laughs> we talk about political prisoners as a thing that happened, and we have hundreds of political prisoners in jail from previous struggles. But we have political prisoners now yeah. that came from Ferguson, that came from George, George Floyd rebellions. Like, and we need to acknowledge them as such. There was one particular case with a teenager, 16 at that age, jo Josh Williams, mm -hmm. who's still in prison. To this day. Um, and he was entrapped. Like he was entrapped. He just, there was a burning quick trip and he went in and he was actually charged for burning it, for arsony, you know? Um, and like him, there were many, th many atrocities that happened that followed to a lot of the leaders of the movement. And, and we, you know, from supposed suicide to like all of these different things, people who had the potential to grow politically and to move people politically. And those lives were taken precisely because they, the state understood that they could not allow for them to be out in the streets. And so we need to also think about, you know, the ways in which we, the the move the the moment the historical moments in which we're living which which seems to me like a decade of like just a people shift attempting to shift history like the that class conflict is really coming like you can mm -hmm. see it you could almost feel it how it's producing again political prisoners 
how is deepening the consciousness of our people but at the same time how is it also arming the state because they're studying us yeah. they've been studying us for many decades and so we need to take this seriously because they are sophisticated they are armed they're equipped you know and so in terms of what has been produced out of each of these struggles you know we've earned that accumulation of experiences and that deepening of consciousness at every step what we, I think, need to be able to do as well is to understand just how serious this fight against the state is and not give ourselves, like we should not in any way, shape or form, give ourselves up to the state and be jailed by the state because they win. Yes. And every, every one of those cases in which people were jailed, whether 2014 or 2020, people needed to fundraise to get money for bail to go into the system again. And we can't continue to do that yeah. because we're feeding the system. When you think about some of the concessions, because they're not even concessions that came out of Ferguson, mm. body body cameras, yeah. money. So budget was given to the cops to be able to get cameras. <laughs> yeah. Money was given to the cops for them to get training. That doesn't work because right. that's not the problem. Yeah. And so, we, you know, the sharpening of our consciousness needs to be aligned also with understanding that we can't continue to feed the pig. That's not what we're here for. And, uh, you know, Joe, <clears throat> I'm so glad you raised Trayvon Martin because mm -hmm. to really understand 2014, we got to understand 2012 mm -hmm. because that is literally uh, when the, the, the seeds of what became the movement for black lives um, really became planted. And, you know, I was in Florida at the time that uh, this was taking place. I mean, I'm from Florida and um, I attended Florida A&M University. And so um, I was actually there um, in town when, you know, the Dream Defenders and groups like this were doing their sit ins at the Capitol. And so we're seeing these uh, different tactics that were taking shape that uh, uh, eventually really took root and uh, bore real fruit in uh, 2014 kind of as a broader context. And another important aspect I think of this is the fact that all of this was happening under the presidency of Barack Obama, oh, yeah. <laughs> the first black president. Oh, yeah. and, and this was a time of, uh, 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 of serious shift in my own political consciousness. Because like a lot of young black people, I was very excited to uh, vote for Barack Obama. Didn't know nothing about him, really. None of us did. And, and I, feel like, <laughs> I feel like black folks haven't really admitted that. Like we, we kind of got caught up in how Obama advertised himself to us that it kind of didn't matter that we hadn't that we didn't really know you know we, we knew Hillary Clinton uh -huh. you know what I mean and but as time goes on you know 2012 you know Trayvon gets killed and all Obama can say is if I had a son he looked like Tray uh, Trayvon okay you know what I'm saying and then in 2014 cool. further undermines the movement I think if, if memory serves I think he had some uh, federal investigation to the Ferguson Police Department which just told us a bunch of stuff mm -hmm. we already mm -hmm. knew and then you fast forward to 2020, and uh, when the slogan of defund the police, which at one point was really only popular amongst activists and organizers, it goes mainstream. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, he pops back up. I guess he took a break from counting his Netflix money. He pops <laughs> back up talking about we can't do uh, uh, empty sloganeering when that is precisely how we got in the White House. Right. Hope and change we can believe in. But what was the hope and change? Uh, uh, casting Libya into a, a failed state mm -hmm. with open air slave markets, mm -hmm. uh, killing Muammar Gaddafi, you know, all these sorts of things. And so it, 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 it really showed, I think it exposed a lot of contradictions mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, within the capitalist state. And I think young people were keenly aware of uh, uh, how this was being maneuvered against him. And, and I think that should bring us to 2020, mm -hmm. the, the, the George Floyd moment, which also had its surrounding context, mm -hmm. a severe economic crisis, mm -hmm. the, the coronavirus pandemic, where the people of this country were completely abandoned mm -hmm. by uh, uh, the capitalist state. You look at countries like China, Cuba, Venezuela, Vietnam, in some cases countries who have far less resources than the U.S., mm -hmm. who had uh, a far better approach to the pandemic and had far less deaths and far less impact as a result. You know what I mean? And so we have people who were flooding the streets every day. I mean, in D.C., it wasn't out of the ordinary to see, you know, one demo demonstration going that way, another going the other. 
you know, y'all are waving while you're passing each other type of deal. Like it, it was that sort of uh, active in the streets. And I think the, the, the state was confused because people were not being cowed by the violence. Mm -hmm. Uh, June 1st, 2020, Donald Trump ordered um, that the area around the White House cleared. I was actually there. And one thing people don't know is that the way he was able to do that was because the mayor of D.C., Muriel Bowser, a so-called progressive, actually implemented a curfew uh, that was able to facilitate that whole thing. So, you know, we're told that Democrats and Republicans are, you know, mortal enemies or whatever. But often, more often than not, we actually see them working hand in glove mm. uh, to uh, suppress these types of movements. But not only did people uh, not uh, allow themselves to be cowed by that repression, they came back the very next day literally holding up their middle fingers to the White House. And so when we talk about this development of uh, uh, consciousness and how people see that, I think that's a big part of it. And, you know, when we're talking about solidarity, I also think it's important that we resist these attempts to, to break our solidarity. Like we see that now with Palestine, right? They say, oh, well, why, why should black people uh, protest with Palestinians? Don't you know that they hate black people or uh, LGBTQ people? All these sorts of things, trying to weaponize people's identities to try to uh, break the vitality of a movement. And that actually leads me to uh, another point that I wanted to, to hit on when we talk about ideological tensions in the movement mm -hmm. and these politics that don't come from a history of struggle. They don't emerge from the grassroots. They come from academia. They come from the nonprofits. And I'm talking specifically about this uh, uh, liberal identity reductionist uh, tendency that has been a, a, a strong uh, tendency within um, the kind of movement for Black Lives Milieu, if you will, uh, pretty much since uh, 2014 in a number of ways. And I, I tend to think that that is another consequence right. of the break in that lineage mm -hmm. because we weren't looking to mm -hmm. uh, the Panthers and such and these revolutionary organizations that we have in, in our tradition. Uh, they were being passed down from basically pre-approved institutions mm -hmm. of this same state uh, apparatus. And so, I mean, Claudia, how have you seen uh, uh, those kinds of dynamics, what kind of impact is what I really want to know. What kind of impact do you think those politics have on the movement? Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Um, <laughs> so, I, again, I, I started doing organizing at 13. Mm. It's been 30 years, so I've seen a lot of things. Um, and the, my way into organizing was intergenerational. It was multinational. It was multi-ethnic. Multi multi, like, it, it, it was just a conglomerate of folks that came from traditions of the 60s and 70s and 80s um, of struggle from within and outside of the United States. Mm. And so for me, when people started kind of creating spaces that were, <laughs> were in, a, in a lot of ways um, violent, I, I think, to a certain mm. extent, where you were like, you're not black enough to so sit, your, sit your down, you know what I'm saying? You're, you're this, you're that, and kind of like creating these spaces where no one else but folks that looked a certain way um, or acted a certain way were were invited to join in or have conversations with and or build with was really shocking to me. And I think it can it, like it started to happen 2012, 2013 and I didn't quite understand what was happening. I didn't have a name for it. I didn't have a an like it was a shock for me because I had grown up and been developed in spaces that were very diverse. Very and my politics assumed had a, a class character to it. I mean, I know I'm a black Caribbean woman, and there's something to be said about that in a patriarchal and racist society, but I am also a worker. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like, what is going on? And it was a younger generation. And so when you start thinking, you know, the fact that you mentioned the academia and the nonprofit industrial complex is so important and so key, because it precisely comes from the academia. It comes from a group of people that have a certain class character that is not a working class character that are bringing these things into a movement, and now you have to articulate and speak a language that is alien to you. Let's not, yeah, like, let, <laughs> let's, let's, let's stop making our organizing spaces places where, you know, people that are new to these types of politics feel like they're walking in a minefield. Yeah. Yeah. They're gonna get castigated for saying the wrong thing. The wrong let's thing. actually stop that. Yeah. You wanna talk about accessibility, let's make your places accessible in that way. Yeah. But, um, you know, 
this sort of identity reductionism, what it is, it's premised on the idea that just because somebody is of a certain identity, that that automatically gives them some sort of magical political clarity. Right. And my answer to that is um, Barack Obama. Right. Right. Arch Uncle Tom extraordinaire king of subterfuge. Right. Barack Obama. Um, this is a black man, right, who destroyed Libya's most prosperous or Africa's most prosperous country mm -hmm. in Libya. This is a black man that signed the Blue Alert Law that, mm -hmm. you know, basically gave local police departments access to surplus military hardware, which they would use against black communities all over the country. Right. Um, this idea that just being of a certain identity completely ignores the fact of like neocolonialism in our communities, it ignores right. the fact of of it being a tactic that the state uses of picking out certain people of a of an oppressed group to represent their interests and show them back to the movement as their leaders. Right. Um, and, you know, like in this day and age, like we have black queer drone operators who are dropping missiles on Yemen right now as we speak. Right. Like, is that person? Is that is that person on my side? No. Now, in this day and age, you have everybody of various identities lined up on opposite sides of the liberation struggle. And that's a reality that people have to accept. Mm -hmm. um, that is a, a reality that has been <clears throat> studied and written about and analyzed in depth by people that have you know fought the struggle before us. It's often wielded, yeah, like I said, it's not from the working class. It's not a working class ideology. It is, a, it is an ideology from academia, from, from, from bourgeois, like liberalism, yeah. essentially. It's not ours, and we need to stop uh, looking looking at our struggle through that lens. There are poor white folks right now in Appalachia that have a better political line than some of these, you know, upper middle class black folks in the city that I live in mm -hmm. that love the police. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There are poor white folks in the southwest of this country that are struggling against, you know, environmental degradation and, you know, police violence or this or that that have better politics than Eric Adams. Right. So like, I think I think we need to actually refocus and, and resharpen our position uh, on this and actually just dead identity reductionist yeah. politics altogether. And I, another aspect of it is that, you know, two of the biggest words that have been utilized in the last decade are representation and diversity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and these have been highly weaponized. Right. And you talked about Obama, but there's Kamala. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, and there's so many. There's there's Richie Torres. Mm -hmm. Right. There's so many that you could just like line up and, and do a study and they are not representative and they are not in our interest. Enemies. There are enemies. There are our class enemies and they actively participate in our annihilation, like right. in our death in our destruction, in our communities, and in the communities abroad. And so when we want to kind of like create this world where, you know, or all black skin are kin, we are living in some other type of reality. Right. We right. are living in another type of reality. Not all women are sisters. That's right. You know, not all black people are kin because their class interest is at the core of their actions, is at the core of the decisions that they make every day. And we, I mean, again, just to, Palestine is such a, it's like the epicenter of struggle right now. These, these folks across the board, bipartisan, right? And across racial lines, and across sexual orientation and identities, have, sit, have stood there and they've defended the US imperialist project. That's right. They've stood there and they've defended colonization. They've stood there and defended genocide. Mm -hmm. That is not the interest of the working class. That is not the interest of black people in the United States. That is not the interest of indigenous people. That is not the interest of mothers that are working class mothers. Mm -hmm. Because having babies in the conditions in which Gaza is without Anastasia, mothers know what that is. Mm -hmm. And so this whole idea of creating groupings based on identities, hmm, okay, don't make that political. Right. <laughs> it could be a cultural club. Like, right. it don't have to be a political, like, it's, the politic behind it is dangerous. It's dangerous. So uh, I, I have a story along the, the vein of identity reductionism. So in 2020 uh, in Denver, this was uh, shortly after the George Floyd uprising popped off, there were thousands of people in the streets almost every single day. Um, it wasn't really led 
yet. So what the mayor decided to do was basically uh, form an organization that was completely astroturfed by people that uh, he got basically from prison, right, um, to lead the movement for black lives in Denver, Colorado. Um, and they were called We Are Love Denver. And what their big thing was, their line was basically, we all just want to get along, right? Can that was their politics. <laughs> Can't we all just get along with the cops? Can't we all just do this? So we were sitting back and be like, hmm, we think that there is an attempt to co-opt the movement here in Denver, right? And it's being led by the mayor himself, right? Using this sort of proxy organization that he essentially formed, um, but tried to keep that under wraps, right? It's led by all black folks, right? There were about three people, but there was one person in particular um, who was like the spokesperson for the movement for black lives in Denver. Um, except their politics was all, we love the cops, right? We just, can we all seem to get along? He was in pictures, marching, ar locking arms with the cops, shaking hands with the mayor, shaking hands with the police chief. Um, and so we exposed this and we actually did have to challenge them openly uh, on the street and it did happen, um, but we exposed this. Um, we introduced a political line that was like, oh no, we're actually not just about, we're not just loving everybody and this and that, whatever. There are serious problems and there are serious grievances here that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. um, you have people all across the country that are saying abolish the police. We are sick of living under the oppression of the police. We literally had the police just murder one of our own a couple months before over this. So why are you talking about we love the cops right now? So we actually had to have this open challenge with this group on the street in Denver. Um, and it actually took the masses of the people in the streets to be like, oh, yeah. They were at up until this point, they were too afraid to challenge these politics because mm -hmm. the leader of this movement was black. black yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it took it had to take myself, who was black, to be like, actually, no. This person is not our friend. Mm -hmm. Their politics are trash. Mm -hmm. This is astroturf by the mayor. We don't hug cops over here. Mm -hmm. We struggle against cops and police brutality and racism mm -hmm. here. Um, so that's just one example. Like we, sh you know, shouldn't be afraid to challenge somebody politically just based on their identity. But that's a part of the weaponization of identity politics. Yeah. Don't question me because I'm X identity. You, they've made an environment that make it really challenging and some sometimes threatening to challenge mm. that that type of because it is a politic mm. <laughs> but it's a politic that works against working class people that work against our collective our collective aspiration to be able to move forward it leaves us it stagnates us it creates these this niches that are comfortable for some people for some people and so it it, it becomes dangerous it becomes a terrible space to be mm. in but we have to challenge it yeah, for sure, for sure. And and speaking about how the uh, movement for Black Lives develops, it it went from a domestic struggle against racism to a movement that took on an internationalist character, which is par for the course when we talk about the Black liberation struggle. And we've mentioned Palestine a couple of times. I mean, I mean Ferguson reinvigorated the historic Black Palestinian uh, uh, solidarity movement. And so, Joel, how do you see uh, the internationalizing of the movement as a development? Why do you think that sort of politic is important? Yeah. So George Jackson has this quote, and I'm kind of vulgarizing it a little bit, but he basically says that the entire colonized world is looking at the black movement in the United States and wondering when we're going to make our move. Mm -hmm. And I keep that at the forefront of my mind. And like, I, I remember how, you know, in Ferguson, for instance, it just looking on social media and seeing people all around the world basically saluting the black movement in the United States. Yeah. Um, because these these people, you know, in the global south, they're also oppressed by imperialism, right? And so they're looking at us and they're like, go ahead. I remember seeing, um, you know, tweets from Palestinians being like, hey, here's how you evade tear gas. Here's how you shield yourself from, from rubber bullets and stuff like that. And, you know, these even with everything that the Palestinian people are going through right now and have been going through for the last 75 years, they still took time out of their day to support the black liberation movement in the United States in that way. And I have to give a huge shout out to them. And to be honest, like we owe them big time. And it's been one of my life's honors to work alongside the Palestinian youth movement right now. 
Um, so I think about just like how so many elements, so many people around the world who are impressed by imperialism in different ways uh, are basically wanting us to, to build the organization necessary to overthrow the system. Um, even in 2020, like there were a lot of, of people all, through, all around the world, you know, like that were, that were sending us letters of support when we were locked up. Like that was, a, that was another huge dimension. Like we had you know, people from Ireland, like the Connolly Youth Movement and, and India and Nepal and, and, and other places and other social movements all around the world um, that, that know that like the black movement in the United States is a, is a huge just like detonator for struggle globally. Um, much in the same way that the Palestinian liberation movement is also a huge detonator for struggle globally. And so, you know, we see each other and I think that, you know, we owe the peoples of the global south um, a victory. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would just add, you know, I, I always think about Che Guevara's quote when he said that the people of the United States have the great honor of dismantling the imperialist base from within. Like that's our, it's in our great contribution to the rest of the world that has been suffocated by U.S. imperialism. And to see these international connections, I mean, the connection of Ferguson with Palestine, it was a, a mechanism of survival. Like how do you survive state repression, which is something that the Palestinian people have been struggling and surviving and resisting for over 75 years? And that the U.S. government, the same government that unleashed the police and the National Guards are the same ones that same government is the same one that finances the colonial state of Israel and the IDF, mm -hmm. you know? And those connections are connections that people were being, were able to make in Ferguson and are able to make now. You know, the same state repression is, is, is coming from the same source. And that level of internationalism and that level of connection amongst working class people, black people, indigenous people, allows us to feel things that are close closer to us and allows us to be able to be in solidarity with each other, which is ultimately, when we think about US imperialism, the only, the only um, weapon strong enough against it is internationalism. That's right. The stronger weapon against that is solidarity, international solidarity. And it's something that the US governments and just the capitalist state attempt to break at all costs. Like they do not want solidarity amongst workers. They do not want solidarity amongst nation states. They want, you know, for us to live in isolation and in states of depression. And what internationalism, internationalism does is break through that. That's what solidarity breaks, you know, through that as well. And so there's a great debt that we owe the rest of the world because our inability to actually create resistance that is sustainable, that is durable, that is able to create an impact internally also puts in jeopardy the lives of people in the rest of the global south. And we should assume that responsibility is something that we we need to be activated around. One thing too is that like even if you know people in our movements don't understand the necessity of internationalism, the capitalist state certainly understands Without the worth of internationalism. You know, we saw like how after the Haitian Revolution mm -hmm. took place, the South immediately locked down because they were so afraid that that revolution could be exported to the South during uh, uh, to the Southern United States. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and we even saw like Haitian revolutionaries fight in the Bolivarian revolutions mm -hmm. and all over the world, like revolutionaries saw each other and they supported each other's struggles. And that, honestly, taking that away was one of the goals of the counterintelligence movement, one of the goals that, that this country had in suppressing the liberation movements of the 60s and 70s was severing that gap uh, and making us forget um, the connections that we had to other struggles in the global south. And so we have to reclaim that now. We cannot listen to the media's lies about this movement or this country or this or whatever. You know, like you should, you should always like look into things first because so many people around the world are looking at us in the United States and they want us to win. Mm -hmm. So we need to we need to build off that. Another aspect of it is that whatever happens domestically is la is a lab, like is a laboratory oh, yeah. for what they're gonna do externally as well, and vice versa. Like Cointel Pro was something that just didn't happen in the United States. Um, in Asia, in India, like there was intelligence that came from the United States. In Latin America, in the Caribbean, the United States also intervened and gathered intelligence counterinsurgency mm. against social, socialist organizations and against social movements. 
during the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and before that. And so we need to be conscious of the fact that the same levels of repression that we experience here at different scale, at a different scale is experienced in the global south, but the same hands are the ones carrying out that dirty business, you know? And, and again, our connection is so deep because it's also a connection not only of repression, but also of resistance. That's right. We could learn so much from the global south in terms of how they've resisted, mm -hmm. you know, centuries of repression by the U.S. So much. I mean, Cuba is there. Venezuela is there. You know, we, we have to learn about the struggle of people who have fought in Colombia for so many many decades with the interventions of the United States. Colombia was practically, you know, what Israel is in right. the region, you know, in our American region. Colombia was for many years an outpost of the United States and was precisely a place that held a lot of the U.S. military bases to attack the Venezuelan revolution easily. And so, but the people in Colombia resisted That's and right. the people of Venezuela resisted. How did they resist? Because Cop City is not just Cop City. It's, you know, it's going to be a school. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be bringing, it's like the School of the Americas. It's also in Georgia. That trains a lot of the dictators mm -hmm. that took over the rest of the continent with the support of the United States. And so they're going to be breeding a whole generation of cops that are there to terrorize, not only inside of the United States, but also in other parts of the world. And we need to be really conscious about that. Yeah, it, it, the, the, our enemies had internationalism. Yeah. Absolutely. They absolutely had internationalism. Yeah. The NYPD goes and trains with the IDF. IDF goes and trains with the Georgia police. Our enemies have internationalism. We need internationalism. Um, that should go without saying. Correct me if I'm wrong. Doesn't NYPD have, like, international offices? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And the, and the New York Police Department. During yeah. Giuliani, I mean, those of us who survived the Giuliani era, I'm one of the survivors of the Giuliani era. Horrible. And when you think about Adams, let's not talk about Adams, but he is like the he has like the baby that comes from Bloomberg and Giuliani. Mm. He's like the baby of you know, and that's horrible. <laughs> but you know, during the Giuliani era, there were cops that were being taken to Mexico to train Mexican police, and they also went to South America as well. And so, and they have offices, yeah. And so, uh, Claudia, I want to swing back in this context of 2020 to the point you made about basically the kind of organization mm -hmm. that has to be in place to uh, uh, make sure that the work is carried through, even when folks are no longer in the streets. And, and this is something that I feel that just about every uh, social movement has to deal with at some point, whether we're talking about George Floyd or Mike Brown or, you know, uh, the movement against the war in Iraq in 2003, so many times before. There's this question of basically, well, what now? Where do we go from here? You know, and there's always that pessimism that lays in with some saying that, well, the protesting, quote unquote, didn't work and people can't allow themselves to become demobilized. But this is why organization is so important, mm -hmm. because uh, this is what sustains a struggle, even when it's at a low ebb. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you were saying that this is sort of what was missing in, in, in Ferguson. And it seems that moving forward, when we talk about the coming period of this struggle, particularly with the rise of a violent uh, uh, far-right movement here in the United States that uh, the Democrats, of course, aren't doing anything about. And so how do you see the question of organization uh, uh, given all of that? I mean, again, I think when we're talking about organization, we're talking about an instrument that serves the people and that reclaims the memory that we need to have, the lessons that we need to have to be able to equip ourselves to do what we need to do, not what we are expected to do by the state, which is you kill a person and then the community will come out and then the movement will disperse and then you'll do it again and then we'll do it again. So it's like a merry-go-round that happens um, where we just keep doing this and keep doing this and keep doing this till one of the two forces kind of tires themselves and their bet is that people will get tired mm -hmm. they're not betting on them getting tired because again they're sophisticated they have all of the weapon that they, they have all the money and so their desire again is to, for people to get tired um and a lot of people do get demoralized in that process in that merry-go-down this is what we did 10 years ago and this is what we're doing again and this is what we're going to do 20 years from now and so i feel like when we 
talk and think about political organizations, we're talking about, again, instruments that are able to hold the memory, but are also able to activate us from more than those times of merry-go-rounds um, that equip us to, to cut with that and actually develop strategies to win. Because we don't want to struggle all the time. Mm -hmm. We don't want to resist all the time. We want to win. And so if we, need, if we need and want to win, we need to develop strategies and we need to develop, develop tactics and we need to do that collectively. And political instruments of our class are the ones that allow us to do that. You know, collectives will come up. A lot of collect collectives came out of uh, Ferguson. Mm -hmm. A lot of, you know, groupings came out of Ferguson, some of which don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think, again, to think about political organizations is not to think about nonprofits. Mm -hmm. And I wanna just mention that because Nonprofits, it's a, it's a huge it's a huge thing. Nonprofit industrial complex. We talk about it. These people are are probably well intended going into these spaces and thinking I'm going to make a revolution through this instrument. And and you can't make an, a, a revolution through an instrument that defines what the trends are, the funding trends are, mm -hmm. that defines what you know your struggle should be. Not the pe not not the streets, not where the people are, but you have hedge funds that are deciding that. You have the Democratic Party that is deciding that for you. You cannot pretend that your enemy is going to be the one that creates an instrument for you to win. And what we want to do is win. And so, you know, in 2020, a similar thing happened. You talked about the defund the police um, demand, which is, which is a demand that people in communities understood, you know, and understood it to the to the extent that developed campaigns people were fighting the mayor of of los angeles in california you know and fought to be able to not have that mayor invest in policing i don't know if you remember it was a huge fight people all across this country understood that there needed to be a divestment from police departments and more money placed into schools more money placed into housing those things resonated and what did the state do through people like Obama and other politicians, liberal politicians that again serve the same status quo, was divert that energy of people struggling and bring it into political holes of power to debate and discuss in ways that didn't serve the people. And what it did was in so many ways dismantle that movement that was developing around the fund of police and then the trends changed. <laughs> right and so i think you know it's 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 a lesson it's it's the lessons that we need to be able to accumulate the same thing will happen now they will attempt to do that with the palestinian movement oh yeah you know they will attempt to say the streets you got to abandon the streets mm -hmm. you got to abandon the idea of building organizations that are counterposing to the state you got to work from within the state you have to talk to your legislators you have to do when we have been proven time and time again that these people betray us at every turn, that it's not in their interest to follow what we, what we actually need to make happen. You have congressmen and women who have sat there to give life to a resolution that supports Zionism, mm -hmm. but they will never sit there and struggle that hard to talk about how do we get the majority of people in this country affordable housing. How do we get the majority of these people in, in, in this country who needed health care? How do we deal with the infrastructure? They don't have those conversations, but they sit there and they're able to, in a bipartisan way, develop a resolution that criminalizes people who are in the streets demanding an end to genocide. That is the society in which we live. And so if we don't have political organization, what happens is that people who are fighting and demanding these things out in the streets that are coming into movement because they're moved, because their hearts and minds are moved to fight against a system that continues to violate us over and over and over again. If there's no, not a political organization to direct that energy, there's no vacuum. The right and liberals <laughs> will take that energy and they will do with it what they please. And so we cannot fear we cannot fear building our own our own instruments. We cannot, you know, fall into this idea that that has been imposed on us that we have to fear power. Right. <laughs> we, we need power. 
We need to have power. This reminds me of Phil Agnew. He always says this. We want power. I want power. We need power. We need it because we can't continue to give this power away to, to the ruling class to do with us whatever they want. Like we are basically committing suicide over and over and over and over again at the hands of these people. And the only way for us to do that is through political organization. And the last thing I'll say is just think about how powerful political organization is that it has been a threat to the state for years, yeah. for hundreds of years. Every time there's been an attempt in the development of a political organization that actually is radical and is revolutionary and stands against what they represent, there's always the attempt from their end to crush that political organization. It happens with the Black, po Black Panther Power, who at some point were called the biggest threat. Right. right? The biggest threat was it happens even with the Moore family. Mm -hmm. They were bombed. <laughs> 1982. We need to understand the power of political organization and why, why these people are so stubbornly insistent in breaking political organization. And if we understand that, then we will have the will to create it because that seems to be the instrument that works. Yeah, and you know, you know, black struggle in, in the U.S. is always seen as a threat to capital, right? Because our um, our exploitation and our oppression is so central to the uh, maintenance of this system, and so the point about organization then is uh, crucially important. And it, it brings me to a, uh, another point about uh, consciousness and how we see uh, that develop. And <laughs> maybe this is an aside because we were talking about co-optation. Uh, you all may remember um, when Rayshard Brooks was killed by oh the police God. in Atlanta, <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. and oh they God. brought up Killer Mike oh and Ti. Yes. And Killer Mike gets up there and starts blubbering because, like, his, he's got some relative that's a cop. Like, we're supposed to care. Mm. T.I. was looking like a shade tree mechanic, talking about Atlanta was Wakanda. Just mess. Had no impact on uh, uh, the young people at all. And so it's just uh, uh, wild to see these many ways that they try to basically sway people from a uh, uh, militant struggle. And, uh, uh, Joel, I wanted to ask because when we look at how – Consciousness has shifted over this decade with the focus being on racist police terror that becomes a deeper analysis of white supremacy in this system. And after a certain point, you saw people saying explicitly that a racist police terror was rooted in uh, capitalism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we see a, uh, a popularity, people like Asada Shakur and, you know, Asada Tatme and, you know, I mean, the extent to which she taught certain folks, I think, is still a question, but it's neither here nor there. <laughs> but 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 you dig what I'm saying. And so when we talk about uh, reaching this point of understanding the role uh, uh, of capital in this and uh, the need to move from that to understanding the need to bring in an entirely new system. I mean, how do you sort of see that uh, shaping out as the, the struggle moves forward? How has it sort of unfolded over these years? Yeah. Well, I think that first comes with organizing that that the for or with understanding that the forces that have oppressed us for so long are organized. They have organizations mm -hmm. themselves. They have organizations in academia. They have organizations in media. They have organizations among the police and military and paramilitaries mm -hmm. um, and, and other parapolitical organizations, fascist groups. Congress in and of itself is an organization. Mm -hmm. You know, the executive and the Supreme Court, these are all organizations. The intelligence agencies are organizations. And all this entire network of organizations are people that you know, they, they protect 1% of people that are being used to exploit and oppress the rest of us. So it sort of stands to reason that the people, in order to win, will need organizations of our own, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, you know, I, I also kind of want to talk a bit about what Claudia said about, you know, what kind of organizations are we referring to? Exactly. Because, yes, a lot of the nonprofit industrial complex will present themselves as, yeah. oh, we're organizations and we, we're taking on this issue that we see as, you know, like you know a big problem and we're going to tackle it and they exist to you know to suck up the energy among young people and this and that but if you really think about the nonprofit industrial complex they're kind of self-perpetuating and insofar as if they actually resolved the problems that they were set out to resolve they wouldn't exist anymore as nonprofits and they wouldn't get funding mm -hmm. so it's like it's this kind of um spiral um that is literally just designed to soak people up and, and to suck up this energy you know and we talk a lot about Join an organization, 
<clears throat> be a part of an organization. We need organizations, but I take that a step further. We need to join the correct organizations, right? An <clears throat> organization with an explicitly revolutionary political line that is saying, actually, no, we don't want to coexist with this system of oppression, period. <clears throat> and we'll be approximating our efforts to, to make that a reality. Um, and so, <clears throat> excuse me. So I think, you know, we talk a lot about the spiral, the police committing atrocity. Mm -hmm. We go out into the streets, we protest. Um, one side gets tired or one side goes home. People are demoralized. All that energy is sort of scattered into the wind. Without an organization, you have just that, like people scattered into the wind. An organization is there to preserve the memory, to analyze the lessons, to synthesize those lessons, to disseminate those lessons, so that the next time it happens, we can build upon what we learned from those lessons. You know, we say it all the time, improvise, adapt, overcome. Improvise, adapt, overcome. You know, we in the party, we say that until our teeth are white, right? <laughs> um, and that, that's the role of an organization. And the more hands you have on deck for an organization, the more you can actually do. Right, the more you can actually extend your tentacles out, um, and and create the conditions for an ultimate victory, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, like also, you know, you said something else too about just like demoralization and people get pessimistic. You know what I mean? I can tell you this right now: nobody that I know who is organizing in earnest, you know what I mean, in in an organization with a serious revolutionary political line is pessimistic, right? Uh, we say this a lot, revolutionary optimism is not a feeling, you know, it's not like, oh, I'm, it's, it's, I'm feeling like, you know, handing out, the, you know, talking to these people today, or door knocking today, or doing this today, it's, it's a discipline, right? It's understanding that, like, you know, no matter what happens, we want to make it easier for the people that come into this space, into this organization, for them to pick up where we, where we are left, right? And, where we left off um and so you know it's not a feeling it's a discipline it's in doing it um and it's in recognizing that ultimately our positions are correct um the the goal of liberating our people is correct um and that's what revolutionary optimism is um and you know people look at the 2020 uprising for instance and they'll say oh it was a failure um, because you know police are still killing us, and oh, check it out, they're also building Cop City in Atlanta, and they're also talking about building another one in Baltimore. And people might look at that particular instance and say, oh, well, we must have failed because we didn't you know, prevent them from doing this. But I would argue the opposite, actually. I would argue that um, it's an expression of fear that the ruling class has of our people uh, that they are building Cop City in Atlanta and that they plan on building Cop Cities everywhere. It's actually an expression of the fear of the enemy of the potential that we have, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, to actually overturn things. Um, and, you know, and I think we should rise to the occasion. Yeah, and, you know, you're actually uh, raising something that I try to point out to people all the time is that, um, you know, if, if what we're doing isn't working, if the movement, you know, quote unquote, isn't working, then why is the state employing all these resources to stop it? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But understanding it um, within that context that, that, that you laid out it is so important. And, and I wanted to uh, uh, move to a couple of topics that became uh, sort of major points of uh, discussion and uh, attention during this period, uh, particularly things like uh, uh, abolishing prisons and abolishing uh, the police which you know uh, became sort of a very pop in terms of going mainstream in uh, 2020, and you know there's a tension between certain uh, ideas of how this plays out, because you know uh, in the party you know we raised the the slogan of jail killer cops, and you know there are people who would would criticize that and say well you know we shouldn't talk about jail and killer cops because this legitimates uh, this aspect of the state, but I think that frankly ignores like the mass sentiment amongst mm -hmm. black people. It's like you, you find any family of someone who had a family member killed by the police. Mm -hmm. And when you speak to them of what they see as justice, they're not necessarily going to say, I want to abolish the police 
as uh, an institution, they want justice for their family member. They want that police officer to face uh, the same consequence that anyone else in society would. That's why, um, you know, it was so significant um, that Darren Wilson uh, was incarcerated. I'm sorry, not Darren Wilson, but uh, Derek Chauvin mm -hmm. was incarcerated for uh, uh, killing George Floyd, which we typically don't see. I mean, more often than not, we know cops get off uh, uh, scot-free when uh, they kill people. Uh, but what I'm getting at is the fact that when we talk about abolishing these capitalist institutions, it, it, it has to be rooted, I think, in uh, addressing the contradictions that give rise to them in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because these institutions are necessary uh, under capitalism for uh, social control and uh, uh, things like this. And so particularly as, you know, uh, uh, Marxist and as people in the Revolutionary Party, I mean, how do you think we should grapple uh, with these kinds of concepts and how we have these conversations, uh, uh, particularly with the uh, fellow organizers around these issues? Yeah, for I mean, I there's a lot to be said about like understanding and you know organizing around the sentiments of people who have lost their kids and their loved ones to police terrorism and having that be a central point in, in organizing if they're about i want this cop who killed my son jailed we should obviously be organizing on the ground to get that to get justice for their kids in that way um I don't go around calling myself an abolitionist. I don't believe we should abolish all prisons. Otherwise, where are we going to put Joe Biden and John Kirby <laughs> right. and George W. Bush and you know <laughs> all these other people, other Hillary, the Clintons, and so on and so forth? Um, that being said, we do have to recognize, yeah, the the prison industrial complex in this country and policing in this country is a tool of social control that is being used against us, sure. right? And so I think you know when we talk of, like that that also has to be central to our to how we discuss this uh, to with with organizers uh, as well is that yeah should the prison industrial complex in this country as it currently exists be abolished absolutely 100 percent but ultimately that's not going to happen in a vacuum right the state is not going to dismantle their frontline forces and their frontline warehouses where they put undesirables on their own they're just simply not going to do that it's going to require a systemic change entirely yeah and go ahead no, I, I agree. I think that, and you talked about mainstream, right? Um, I think that the <laughs> abolition has become a mainstream word that is that lives within a context too, you know? Um, and it doesn't necessarily speak to the sentiment or the demands of people in our communities generally, mm -hmm. right? Um, is it something that the abolition of private property, the abolition of prisons, the abolition, the abolition of all terror, you know, imposing structures is what we need to fight against. Right. But if we only take the question of abolition as it comes to incarceration and policing and kind of refuse to talk about the state, refuse to talk about the capitalist system, refuse to talk about, I have issues with that. Mm -hmm. Because in order for you to be able to sustain anything in society, you need to have power over that society. People need to have power over that society. We're talking about revolution. Abolition of it in and of itself would cannot exist, right? And so the, the way in which this has kind of been extracted, I have issues talking about abolition and not talking about George Jackson mm -hmm. and about the struggle of, of men, black men, within the terror, like terrorizing institution of in car like prisons. Like that, those folks were organizing within the walls and theories came out of that as well. And so we can't talk about abolition and not talk about that. <laughs> and if you look at what George Jackson was reading, he was reading Marxist Leninist books. That's right. He had a concrete analysis of the conditions of prisoners and of black people, working class people all across internationally as well. And so I think that there is a deviation of sorts in ideology that is very intentional because it's comfortable for some people. It's comfortable to write about abolition without dealing with the material conditions and realities of our communities that are economic, that are social, that are political, that are cultural, and that have been imposed by us, imposed to us by a capitalist system. There's no way that you can 
you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Right. <laughs> you gotta fight, you gotta fight the whole system. And so, you know, to think about what are we what are we gonna do about, you know, Joe Biden, what are we gonna do about, about Trump, what are we gonna do about all these war criminals and all these corrupted killer cops, like fascists. Fascists. Yeah. The 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 proud boys. Like, where do you put them? Like you thinking about abolition, I'm thinking about how do we stop these these people from coming back? Because they're gonna come back, and we can't continue to have them coming back. And so we need to control them. Right now, we have a small minority of people that control us, that surveil us. The majority of people in this country. At some point, we're gonna have to control them. At some point, we're gonna have to stop them from killing more black and brown and poor white people. And so the idea of just abolishing prisons, I could see how it doesn't talk to the majority of people in this country. I could see that. Because what do you do with people that terrorize you? What do you do with people that rape? What do you do? Like, what do you do with that? You know, And the idea, again, of abolition divorced from the idea of ending capitalism is not is not feasible. I think it comes down to also to just like, do people have it had the actuality of revolution like as a central feature in their in their political analysis yeah, too? True. I feel like a lot of you know people that I talked to who who went, oh yeah, I'm an abolitionist. It's just like okay, cool. So you know, do you believe that you know workers should you know control the means of production and you know like have you know a say in how our economic and political system is run? Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. Oh well, cool. So do I. But you don't call yourself a communist. Why is that? And I have, you know, I think that has a lot to do with just like the fact that we live in, you know, the anti-communist capital of the world, yeah. the United States, and you know that has, you know, spent billions of dollars and resources and has funded their own media and education and our in academia and this and that to basically make communism out to be a dirty word. Mm -hmm. And so I think that a lot of people, you know, even people that you know on our side are afraid to actually say that. And so, you know, abolition becomes, you know, like a political signifier. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I, I do think that has a lot to do with it as well. Um, that being said, you know, we definitely want to, to in, you know, in 2020, there was a piece that was written just about, like, our party's position on abolition and, and what it actually means. And yes, we definitely, uh, you know, stand behind the sentiment of people that are, you know, saying, yes, we want to abolish the police and abolish prisons, sure. Let's refine the theory some. Let's mm -hmm. let's let's sharpen what the expression that that you're talking about. Let's actually have that conversation and what that means, um, because when you do have that conversation, you can't help but not divorce the okay. concept of abolition from revolution and from socialism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you you and Claudia both mentioned uh, revolution, which is very important because this is something that happens in phases mm -hmm. and stages. And there are contradictions that have to be reconciled. And then once those are reconciled, it's going to be a whole new group of them that <laughs> rise up in their place. You know what I mean? And so I actually think this is connected to uh, what we were talking about um, uh, uh, organization because it sort of helps to anchor you. I mean, frankly, in reality, yeah. if, it, if it's the right kind of organization that is orienting you and uh, 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 directing your actions in that way so uh, that we have that clarity. But this concept of the actuality of revolution, I think is so important, especially when we talk about that revolutionary optimism, because revolution, which in, in our context means uh, the complete overturning of the capitalist system and the bringing in of the socialist system, right? Revolution can't just be a good idea or something that sounds good. Or feels good. Right. right. <laughs> and, and it can't be a thing where we're uh, sort of you know, just kind of reveling in the glory of the revolutions of the past in Haiti and in mm -hmm. Cuba and in China and all these sorts of things. If we're serious about carrying through uh, a revolution, then that requires that we be organized. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Because uh, this capitalist state that is hell-bent on destroying us, highly organized, highly centralized, highly class-conscious. And if we think that we can meet that level of organization with disorganization and win, 
That's just mm-hmm. foolish thinking. Yeah, Malcolm, Malcolm said it. We're not outnumbered. We're out-organized. That's and fact. we've been out-organized for a long time. I mean, Malcolm said that in the 60s. We're still, we're still out-organized. And this, it goes back to the question of like building political organization, being able to build the force, being able to have the memory that is the accumulation of experiences that synthesizes those experiences, those lessons, and equips us for more, for doing effective things, for practicing in a way that makes a dent, that is significant so that in the next stage, because you also talked about stages and phases, mm-hmm. so that in the next stage we're stronger than what we were at this particular stage in, 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 in history. And I, I honestly do feel that in terms of like the revolutionary optimism and the revolutionary, you know, the, act, the actuality of revolution, revolutionary optimism, revolutionary hope, revolutionary love for our people, like right. all of these different things, sometimes they become so loosey-goosey yeah. and people utilize them in ways that is like, yeah. you know, it, it, there's a militancy behind that. Mm-hmm. There's a discipline behind that. Mm-hmm. There is a pra- praxis behind that. There is, you know, organization behind that. There is failure behind that. There are lessons behind that. Mm-hmm. There, are, you know, there is so much that that maintains that revolutionary optimism, that builds that revolutionary. When we talk about revolution, it's something we build. Like we literally put our, you know, sleeves up and we build it. We can't just think it and talk it. We have to do it. And so it is very important for us to, to understand that because it's easy now in like in this world of social media for all of us to kind of like become, you know, armchair revolutionaries right. and have all sorts of analysis, which is good. I mean, you need analysis, you need ideas, you need emotions. But if you're not willing to go out and actually build with the people that are in the most marginalized conditions, because right. that's, that's another thing, you know, with the people who feel they've lost everything and yet they have nothing else to lose, so let's break these chains. Those are the people that we want to be able to build with. Those are the people that we want to be able to move to a space of hopefulness, not on the base of, like, you know, ideas, but on the basis of their strengths to be able to change their material conditions, which is ultimately the type of force that we need to be able to be a force to be reckoned with against the state. And whenever that, that starts to happen in history, that's when they start shaking in their boots. That's where they're like, let's build a cop city. Mm-hmm. Right. That's where they're like, let's build this offensive because they're coming for us. Mm-hmm. And we need to play in all fronts as working class people. Therefore, we need organization. We can't just rely on we feel good when we come into com- community and we have these reflections and these circles and it's so great. That's mm-hmm. That doesn't help. Mm-hmm. We need spaces like that, but we need militancy. Mm-hmm. We need political parties of the of the working class. Mm-hmm. We need space of study, reflection, and action. 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 And I think we've been, you know, again, dismembered and dismantled intentionally by the state in many different ways and have not been allowed to see just how powerful we could be because, again, our lineage was broken, but we need to, like the Sankofa, you know, we need to look back to move forward. And we need to identify who who these people that we hold so high, Fred Hampton, you know, Claudia Jones, all these different individuals did not work individually. They didn't work on their own. They had organization, and therefore we need organization too. Um, Vowen Zap uh, was a general in Vietnam. He was one of the top generals in the struggle there. He wrote this book called Military Art of People's War, which is kind of like a history book slash organizing manual. Um, but you know, he emphasizes very much that this struggle is a protracted one. When you are a um, much weaker organization, weaker force going against a much larger organization, it is necessary uh, that it's protracted. It's necessary to use what you have to get what you need. And he talks about how in the opening phases of the war against the Japanese in the 40s, they were fighting them with spears and sticks and stones. And in the span of 30 years, they were able to basically send the largest and most powerful imperial military packing in helicopters from the embassy 30 years later. Um, and you know, like those, those conditions had to be built, like what Claudia said. Right, they had to be built, constructed, rolled up your sleeves, and it's not easy. Mm-hmm. 
people, you know, getting into this work, like, have to understand that this is not, you know, like, it's not all rosy all the time. It's, it's very better, hard. It's not a bed of roses. It's right, it's not, not a bed of roses, and it's not a dinner party. Yeah. You know what I mean? You have to uh, have a lot of metal, a lot of strength. You have to be able to withstand attacks from all sides, from the state, mm -hmm. from the right, from other elements and entities. You know what I mean? And, um, but there are no shortcuts either. There are lessons to be learned. There are mistakes to be made. There are retreats sometimes. Um, but those experiences are what allow you to move forward in this. And there's, I, I hate to say it, but there is no other way. There is no other way um, that we can actually see the other side of liberation without these things, without the victories and without the retreats. Um, and I think that that's something that, that people need to understand when getting into this. Um, yeah, and also too, just like we're not, we have to understand what our conditions are. We're not socialized in factories, you know, like in the early 20th century Russia or this or that. We're not socialized in these kind of communal environments now. We're in the digital social media age, right? Where everybody can be a micro celebrity. Everybody can be a thought leader. Everybody can be like an individual, you know, podcast or whatever doing this or that. This is the soil, right? That we're, that we're tilling, that we have to work with, right? Um, and it's just, how do we adjust our strategies to this reality, right? Um, it, there's, there's a lot to be said for, you know, how social media is a double-edged sword, how it's, you know, great that information is, this, is, is spread uh, so quickly and how we're able to see things and how in a way, like, consciousness can be, uh, you know, enhanced with it, but it also can be used as a tool for state counterinsurgency as well. Um, so it's just understanding that there's contradictions with everything and some contradictions won't be resolved. Some contradictions just exist to confound. Um, but as a revolutionary organization, we're here to resolve the contradiction, right? Resolve this, this contradiction that we're, that we're living in right now. So Joe, when, you, when we talk about these uh, lessons, particularly around uh, a state repression mm -hmm. um, of social movements, and this is something that you yourself uh, have experience with, um, organizing in the Denver and Aurora, uh, Colorado areas around uh, the police killing of uh, Elijah McClain, uh, something that kicked off a massive uh, uh, movement there in that area. And I was hoping you could tell us some about those uh, uh, experiences, uh, what you were able to glean from them, and, and what do you think it tells us about uh, not only sort of the character of the state, but how we respond to that. I think if there's one story that highlights the necessity of organization, it was definitely what happened in Denver and Aurora between the fall of 2019 and 2020, that entire year. Um, so Elijah McClain was killed by the Aurora PD in the late summer of 2019, right? And it was one of the situations where, uh, you know, cops, the DA saw it, and they were like, oh, open, shut case, I guess he deserved it. So no, no charges for the cops, nothing, nothing to see here. Case closed, whatever, this or that. Um, the party, though, however, was very quickly able to respond to what happened, um, getting with the family, meeting the family, uh, meeting other community organizations and, and people in the community that were, were concerned about this issue and wanted to raise it. Um, and, you know, even after the DA basically said, no charges, nothing's going on with this, we still continue to build with the people in that community and the people in that neighborhood, right? So by the time um, the George Floyd uprising kicked off nationally, um, there was there were protests in Denver and Aurora, or there were protests in Denver that were happening at the time. Um, but we were very quickly to be able to be like, hey, look, there's there's a situation literally just down the street that just happened this last year, um, and because there were protests that were going on, and because there had been organizers there. Um, since 2019 that we're working in the community and with people there, we were very easily able to quickly take the reins of that situation and amplify a struggle um, or and amplify a situation that was going on in Aurora at the time and bring the protests there, right? Um, and those were the largest protests that Aurora had seen in 2020 for Elijah McClain. Um, so I think it just emphasizes the importance of of sticking with it of diligence of of persistence in the struggle and and not getting discouraged in struggle because you never know when something might pop off and having an infrastructure that is there um 
to support people and to support you know the people's desires to see the situation amplified and justice to be served, um, we have to be there for that. Um, one thing also, another lesson is that like if you are effective in your protesting, the state will come after you. Mm -hmm. They will try and dismantle you. It's, it's a reflex, right? I mean, the state reflexively uh, goes after and targets any threats to its legitimacy. That's science, right? There's, there's, there's a push and then there's a pull, right? Um, and we saw that uh, in Aurora. Um, they attempted to, you know, we were leading these massive protests in Denver and Aurora in 2020, and they were able, and they, they went after the, the leadership, which was the PSL at the time. And uh, at, on September, 20, September 17th, 2020, uh, they showed up to my apartment with the armored personnel carrier, um, basically pulled up with a SWAT team, arrested me, took me out of my apartment, took me to jail where I spent eight days, uh, and they charged me and two uh, other comrades in the party uh, with pretty serious charges. Um, I was looking at 48 years in prison um, if I was convicted of kidnapping cops for a protest that we had outside of a police station. Um, and so after that happened, and again, another reason for organization, the party quickly uh, mobilized uh, for our defense. Um, there were mass protests. There was a huge uh, defense campaign that was launched. Uh, people were looking at the situation, not just nationally, but internationally as well. Um, we had statements of support from you know, people in Ireland, people in Nepal, people in Ghana, people all over the world were saying, hey, uh, this is like political repression uh, and, and suppression of people that are just trying to fight for justice for a young man that we all saw on camera get lynched by the police. Um, and so that was a that was a very trying time. Um, it was it was frightening. It was just dealing with with the prospect of spending you know a good chunk of my life in prison. But ultimately, like having an organization that that was able to turn on a dime and mobilize on our behalf um, was a force multiplier. And I think a lot of people came to recognize um, that that the organization was necessary and, and joined a lot after that. And not only did we uh, get our charges cleared, but they wound up charging the police who killed Elijah McLean. And one of them is currently sitting in prison right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are lessons to be learned mm -hmm. um, and just, yeah, that's all I got to say on that. I mean, I think generally, and I hear you speak, and I've always said, and I believe it, and I affirm it, and I think, you know, folks who are listening, who are just coming into movement, and those of us who have been in movement for many years, we need to be able to understand that political organization is both the spear and the shield. That's right. <laughs> it's the spear right. and the shield. Like, we utilize it, again, to advance our struggles, to fight back, and it shields us from that state. And if we don't have political organization, we're in the winds. We are out there to be caught and be, you know, continue to receive attacks from a state that does not want us to organize against them. So it is the spear and it is the shield. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in the final analysis, when we talk about this river of black struggle in the United States, it's a river that flows to revolutionary change in this country, but will only get there through organization. And specifically, will only get there with the vehicle of a revolutionary party. And we want everyone listening and watching to know that you can join the Party for Socialism and Liberation by visiting pslweb.org slash join. Thanks so much for watching and listening. Peace.